Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Cam Webster, and welcome to The Art of Boring, the podcast where we dive deeper into Moore's investment philosophy and thinking in order to help you, our listeners, become more informed investors. Ultimately, we hope to connect you with the people at Moore who find excitement in delivering on Be Boring, Make Money. In this episode, we speak with Justin Anderson, Canadian equity analyst and leader of Moore's zone of experimentation called The Lab. The Lab focuses on two main areas, applying new technologies to get an edge in the market, and two, automating and streamlining the investment process. Some of the highlights of our conversation include the analogy of poker and the need to find the weakest table, our views on the human plus machine model, Moneyball applied to investment decision making, and the machine-driven movie ratings of Rotten Tomatoes. We hope you enjoy the podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Information relating to investment approaches or individual investments should not be construed as advice or endorsement. Any views expressed in this podcast are based upon the information available at the time and are subject to change. Why don't we start with just uh, giving us an introduction to the lab, kind of what is it, What's the genesis of it? So how did it come about and, and start there? Sure. So the kind of founding personality, let's say, or the inspirational personality behind the lab, I would say, is a guy named Ed Thorpe. Still alive, by the way. He's, I think he's in his 90s right now. Um, and he was a math professor at MIT. And what he did was he was a very curious guy, and he always wanted to find out, you know, solve some kind of problem and discover an edge and figure out a solution to the edge. So he started off at MIT, math professor. Then he he was the guy who invented card counting. So if you're, if you're familiar with blackjack, he wrote the book on on blackjack on how to card count on blackjack. And so he did that, and he actually went to casinos. He had some students with him, and they trained, and they actually would beat the the casino using card counting. And they made a, they actually made a lot of money doing this. How long did it take for them to be banned? Well, that's just it, right? So they did that for a couple of years, got the kinks out, that and long? then and then the casinos kind of got onto them, and there were some kind of dicey moments. And then pretty soon he was, he figured, you know what, they were making changes to the rules of blackjack. They were thickening the shoe, meaning that how many decks are in a given, oh, okay. in, on a given uh, blackjack game, May, basically taking steps to make it harder to win by card counting. And so, so he basically- is that putting the odds back in the house's favor? Putting the odds it? back in okay. the house's favor. So, right. so his attitude was, okay, well, let's move on to the next thing. So he went on to roulette and he actually built like a time counter thing to figure out how to, you know, when the ball was being thrown, if you could click it and use physics, the principles of physics, he could kind of sort out with a slightly higher probability than 50-50 where the steel ball was going to land uh, when it was done at circles. And then again, they kind of got onto him and they, you know, a couple years later, he made some money and then they started making, changing the rules on him. And it's important that we kind of tell this story because this theme of the rules changing is actually very applicable to the market and, and things are always shifting and changing in the market as well. And, and so that's why he's so foundational a personality for us because it's sort of this concept is, yeah, in the market, the rules are always changing and that where you find the edge, where you can, you know, earn, earn money and, and have a success of finding the right companies to invest in, that can also change as well. So the kind of the principle of the lab or the foundational reason why it exists is to sort of accept that premise and to say, hey, the, the market's always changing. There is this kind of foundational investment process that we have, which is, which is excellent, but we also need to be you know, able to shift and pivot some of where we're looking, what part of the forest we're looking in, how we're doing our different, applying these tried and true methods of investing in order to be able to adapt to those changes. So I think that's kind of a summary of the, the background of it and why Ed Thorpe is kind of the motivating personality. So within that context, are we more the house or are we more... Mr. Thorpe trying to figure things out. Well, I, yeah, I mean, we're we're Thorpe, and the house is the market. So we're 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 trying to, yeah, we're we're trying to sort out, you know, where where is the market or the house most inefficient today? And it's not the same as it was yesterday or the day before that, right? So it's always shifting, and we'll get into this idea of why we have to tinker so much. But that's the, the basic premise of it: is the market's always changing. So we need an innovative engine that also can pivot and change on a very solid foundation, which is our investment process. We talk about Thorpe as the the genesis of it. How is it personally of interest to you? So in your day-to-day, Justin, um, you're an equity analyst on the Canadian equity team, but how does your day look in terms of lab versus kind of pure stock analysis? Sure. So for me, the interest is I fundamentally see myself as an investor. So that's that's kind of my identity, and I want to be the best investor possible. And the analogy I like to use a lot is is poker, okay? If you go and play poker, there's two things that really matter if you're going to be successful at poker. 
first is you got to play good poker. <laughs> so you got to, you can't be folding when you have pocket aces pre-flop. You, you, you know, you can't be going all in if you're due seven and you're going to last very long. No, you, there's some basic principles of poker that if you don't follow those principles, you're going to fail at poker. And it's very similar to investing. The, the more investment process of finding good business models and good managers, attractive valuations, I would call that playing good poker. So that's following that process is sort of a requirement to be successful as an investor. But there's another aspect of poker that often gets overlooked, which is if you're sitting down with a bunch of sharks, it's going to be hard to win, even if you're playing the best poker in the world. If everybody else is also playing the best poker in the world, then the game is tough. But if you're playing the best poker and you're playing at a weak table, well, suddenly you can make a lot of money. And so the analogy to the lab is sort of, you know, we're playing very good poker at Moore. We've got a very good process, excellent investors here. We, we've got some of the best investors, I think, out there. So we've got that part of it down packed. The part that the lab is sort of interested in is saying, okay, well, how can we find the right table to play? How can we aim, you know, and play that game where there's the most opportunity? So I think that's fundamentally what, you know, what the purpose is and why I'm interested in it is as an investor, yeah, I want to I wanna make the most money possible and, and play at the right table. So that's why I'm with more because they're great at poker. And that's why I'd like to tinker with the lab because I think it's a way to open up opportunities. So let's get into a little more in terms of the, the depth of the lab and day-to-day -day what we're doing. Sure. So I, I think the, the way to think about it is, okay, well, how do you find this table that no one is playing. So that's sort of the fundamental problem that the lab is trying to achieve, right? To use the poker analogy. And how do you go about doing that? Well, what it requires is you have to go and try things that nobody's really done or done well. So that's the idea of tinkering, right? So you've got to go to places, nobody's really tested this relationship or run this kind of analysis or, or applied this process. And what that means is if nobody else is doing it, oftentimes there's a good reason why nobody else is doing it because it's not going to work <laughs> or, or there's something fundamentally wrong with it, right? So you run into this problem where you need to have a system, you need to have a process in place that is where failure is acceptable. Not only is it acceptable, it's part of success. So it's how you get to success is you fail 10 times and then on the 11th time you find that new way of screening things or you build this new DCF engine or you you know run this new money ball process that – and we'll get into some of these examples. But you happen upon that successful kind of recipe. But for the lab to, to be a success, it, it needs to be very tolerant of failure and it needs to fail quickly. It needs to tinker a lot. It needs to play around with different ways because it's trying to find that table. You know, and, and, and to do that is not easy and, and requires a lot of, of repetition because if it was easy, somebody else would have done it already. That's by definition, you know, so, so that's kind of the concept behind it is, is, is tinker a lot, fail very quickly, get a lot of feedback, you know, and move on to the next thing until you find that success. Let's try and get an example out there for, for listeners to understand. So fast failures, can you give us a couple of fast failures that you've tried? Market's too efficient wrong table type conclusion. Yeah. So a couple examples of fast failures. I think, you know, a lot of our core tools that we're using today are, they sound like successes because you're, you're going to be familiar with them, but underneath them were a whole bunch of failures. So a good example would be the auto DCF, right? So the auto DCF is something that we're actually using a lot now to, for the listeners, the, what the auto DCF is, is, is sort of a, a tool that lets you build a DCF model, a discounted cash flow model within sort of a, a, a 10 second time frame. So you click a button, you put in a company and within 10 seconds, you've got computer using a, diff a, a bunch of processes, base rates, processes and others. It'll seed the assumptions for that company and say, okay, here's my basic assumptions now. And then it'll hand the model over to the analyst who can then change the assumptions, but they've already got the model already set up and it, it gives an initial valuation. So our model is roughly 14 tab Excel spreadsheet. So what you're telling us is that in 10 seconds, you're using a data source to populate that 14 tab spreadsheet and have it set up and ready to go for an analyst to go, well, we talked to management team last week and here's some of the answers on the questions. It may mean that actually the range on revenue growth instead of pre-populated auto DCF is eight to 10. We actually think it's 10 to 12. I think you articulated that perfectly. So that's exactly right. So you take the 14 thing you, and then maybe adjust some of the assumptions. And there's sort of two paths for it. The one path is that where the analyst can go in and change the assumptions. Then there's another path to use it as a screening tool where the analyst doesn't make changes. We run it on 16,000 companies in the universe of stuff that we can invest in. And then it gives us an initial 
take on its take on the computer's take, let's say, of what the return potential is of the company. And so that can then become, it doesn't mean we go and invest in those, but it can become a screening tool for us to say, okay, well, let's look at the ones that the computer is saying are the best value and then dig into those and start doing some due diligence into them. So within the development of the auto discounted cash flow model, what were the fast failures? So some of the fast failures, I mean, they were, I would just say earlier versions of the auto DCF that are now in the garbage bin and no one will ever see them. So, okay. you know, I, I, a model that was, you know, polling data maybe from a different source or maybe it wasn't amalgamating a lot. So a lot of it was in the case of auto DCF, it was kind of a success. So it's hard to talk about, you know, homo, I don't know if you're the history of evolution of humans, but you know, there's homo erectus and, and homo habilis and all these guys, were they really failures or were they sort of part of the evolutionary process? So, so yeah, I would put it more in a, in kind of an evolutionary terms in that case. Okay. So the auto DCF is more tinkering, oh, this data didn't populate right, or let's clean it up type thing. Is, is there anything that started kind of as a, call it a null hypothesis, like, oh, we got this one figured out. We have an edge here. And then you, you proceeded into it and quickly figured out that, oh, no, we were wrong. Yeah, in, like in there, some let me give you a better example. So I, I see where you're trying to get at, and I appreciate that. So a, a, an example would be like Moneyball. When we were doing Moneyball, we were trying to, the, the concept behind it is from, if people have seen the show Moneyball, it's the Oakland A's was, they had this uh, recruiter who, and the Oakland A's didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> and so he wanted to apply a different process to recruiting the best players. And so instead of using sort of gut feel and emotions to make those decisions, he, he used statistics and he had a lot of success of it. So the idea of Moneyball was to say, well, can we apply a similar kind of statistical look back at our own funds at more and sort of determine, hey, you know, this has been a success or, or not, not based on how we feel about it, but more on a systematic kind of scientific approach. So part of Moneyball included a bunch of sub-analyses, let's call it. And I would, I would say that some of those sub-analyses came to conclusions that weren't justified. So you could call those failures in a sense. You know, one example would be when we first ran a process on Moneyball, we found that there was a very low correlation with valuation and a high correlation with quality scores in our risk, in our matrix scoring. So part of our matrix scoring is we, we give a score to the valuation potential or value, the return potential, and then also the quality. And what we found was that the quality was highly correlated with positive returns. Um, so if, if companies that were higher quality did very well and, and companies that had more expensive valuations also did well. So if they had high return potential, they did, they did poorly. <laughs> so it was kind of a negative correlation, which would be kind of a surprise to a core investor, right? And I think the reason I would call that, I wouldn't necessarily call it a failure. <laughs> I know you're trying to find a cleaner failure, but, but I think the conclusion is wrong and, and, and it highlights part of the why is it wrong that that was the case. It, the problem is we were in this period of the last five years of kind of let's call it a quality rally where the quality stocks have done very well. And so it's it's easy to kind of take away the wrong message, which can be like, oh, valuation doesn't matter. And all that matters is buy high quality businesses. Um, and that might have been true for the last five years, but it's certainly not necessarily going to be true for the next five years. And I think it, it, it's an important story to highlight because it tells the story about how easy it is to fool yourself when you're applying statistics to investing because you're dealing in a world that is the causal relationships are so weak and between what causes a stock to go up, for example, we don't really understand that the cycle times are so long. And so it's, it's very easy to kind of fool yourself and think that, Hey, this is caused because of this, but really you're just looking at kind of a relationship that happened over the last five years. So that might be a case where you came to conclusions based on something too quickly and it's like, no, no, you got to take a step back and do a bunch of more analyses before you can sort of gain a, even a little bit of confidence in, in, in your conclusion. On that example, I guess, would be within the lab, Moneyball is, is what type of directional pursuit? So is that looking at what we do internally and evaluating whether a process adds value? Is that a good summation of what Moneyball might be? And then what else are we looking at beyond that? So I, th I would say the lab is engaged in two main areas. So one would be the money ball area, which is where we're trying to assess our own performance in a much more granular way 
than sort of the superficial metrics will tell you. If you looked at attribution analysis or something, we want to go a lot deeper and we want to understand, okay, where in our due diligence stages from screening to management meetings to reports, you know, diving deeper on a company to valuation and to a final decision. And then after the decision, trading that we do post-decision, so, you know, how we decide to weigh the the stock in the portfolio, all of those, you can break down all of our process into all these sub-decisions. And Moneyball is trying to, as best as it can, again, it's a very difficult process because of some of the things we just talked about, is, is trying to sort out, okay, where's the most value been created and, and, and where's less value been created so that we can emphasize more, you know, the, the stuff that's working and de-emphasize or automate more the stuff that isn't working as as well. So Moneyball would be one, and then the other big one would be sort of, let's call it automation or automating the existing process. So so not deviating necessarily from the, the more process of, you know, the three-step process that we always talk about. It's more like, how can we take those steps and do a lot more with a lot less? So, you know, for example, the auto DCF, now I can screen companies much faster using that tool than I could if I had to build a manual model every single time I wanted to run evaluation on a company, right? So, and there's a bunch of processes, I would say, that are involved in, in that part of, of the lab automation. So which side of those two would be identifying the right table? That's a good point. I'd say both of them to some extent. So the money ball for sure, because if you can discover what is working, you can say, hey, this is where there's more value being created. And whereas the rest of investors may not have that same degree of insight. And so they might be applying their resources judiciously over everything, whereas we're focusing that resource in the part of the process that is having the most value creation. So that would clearly be kind of right table type stuff. I would say within automation, there's a lot as well, because part of being a good investor is your time. You know, we just talked about how Ed Thorpe was always shifting every couple of years. He would shift to a different game. Why was he doing that? Well, he was doing that because the opportunity was closing every time he started a new game because, you know, and that's the same thing that happens in the market. There's a lot of people who also follow the more process of, you know, let's call it Buffett style investing. And a lot of people do that. And so that's, that game is becoming very efficient. So we, we need to have a process where we're always able to kind of find and, and be faster and better than the competition is at doing that. And so by automating our screening and, and streamlining different processes, I would say that would make us better investors because we can just do a lot more with a lot less versus the competition. Taking that a step further, usually if there's an edge found in the market, maybe M&A arbitrage is one good example where more and more money piles in, the more and more money that piles into a strategy, the less and less alpha there is, and it gets arbitraged away. So in this man and machine, human and machine, big data, machine learning environment, in your opinion, Justin, is is there a, a potential where you invest a lot of time and effort in coming up with these tools and the lab, but everybody else is doing it, therefore the advantages of it get arbitraged away? Or is there so much data out there now that actually there's increased opportunity to find an edge. No, I think it's the former. They will get arbitraged away. And if we're not doing the arbitraging, we're not going to be making the money. And and that, that the idea is that you have a sliver of time. No one knows how long that time is. But the thing is, the, the, the great thing is it'll change. So in 10 years, it'll be a different sliver. So I think there's always going to be a pivot. It's a good time to talk about chess because I want to, in the context of that discussion, I think it makes a lot of sense to bring up the example of chess. So in the, in the history of chess, Okay, you had grandmasters, right? Like you had these Gary Kasparovs and, and all those guys, and they were the best chess players. And then there was this time you heard about Deep Blue and IBM, and they came along and they built these chess machines that were beating Kasparov. They were better. Case closed, right? Game yep, over. Done. The the chess players lose. The the humans lost to the computers. <laughs> Let's all pack up our bags and you know go and do a different business because the computers are taken over. Right. And, and I think there's a lot of people that believe that today with the markets and investing is they kind of see the similar analogy where the, the computers are coming in. You see all this passive investing and they're applying all these kind of factor based models and ETFs and all this sort of thing. And it's like, oh, look, you know, this is the future. The, the old school of active investing is over. And some might argue, well, isn't that kind of what you're doing with the lab is you're trying to build all these machines to kind of get rid of the humans. And so, so let's come back to chess, okay? So, so what really happened in chess is, the, in fact, the, the computers were winning. And then Kasparov, actually, ironically enough, came up with a game and he said, okay, let's change the rules. It's not just humans or computers. We'll let people play chess and they can use anything they want to play chess. They, we're going to give an unconstrained game. So if you want, you're ulti- the human ultimately can make the decision, but you can use whatever chess programs you want. You can do whatever you want. Right. No rules. Yep. Anything goes. Okay. And so what did humans start doing? All the chess players, well, they started 
getting computers and all these chess programs and they started putting them together. They started using multiple chess programs to, to kind of triangulate on things. And what emerged from this is just fascinating is that the best players became not the computers, which were up until that moment the best. They became these kind of amateur players, chess players, who really were good at using the computers to help them solve the problem. So the, the best player wasn't the human grandmaster. It wasn't the, the computer on its own. It was a sort of, let's call it an amateur player. Not like amateur as far as Grandmaster goes. Not as good as Kasparov alone. Not nearly as good. Like Kasparov one-on-one -on -one without a computer would totally destroy this person. But they would beat Kasparov if Kasparov had a computer and they had a computer because they know how to use and leverage the computer to help them become a better chess player. So it's a really fascinating emergence. And, you're, and we call these people centaurs. Is kind of the name that they started calling them. Centaurs because man plus machine. And they emerged and they currently are and today in all the, the chess tournaments that are going on today. They are the best players. They're the ones who are consistently winning against both grandmasters and the best supercomputers out there. So you're, you're trying to marry human intelligence and a machine that's been taught the rules, I guess, and in one instance can beat the human. But what, what I'm hearing from you is the limiting factor may not actually be the human intelligence or the rules of the game, that there's, there's some quantum in the two of them being collectively adding to more than two. Yeah, Colin. I think the lesson of, of the centaurs is that there are things that humans do and reasoning that we have that at least for the foreseeable future, I mean, maybe this changes in 100 years, but in the next, let's call it 20 years, computers can't match. Like There, there are certain kinds of judgment calls and certain sorts of decision making. It's not, it, it's very fo a certain set of types of decisions and processes where humans are far superior to computers, even the best trained computer you can find. But there's a lot where the computers are a lot better than the humans, where they don't have the same kind of psychological biases and they, they, can, they can package a lot of different data much more systematically. And I think we're in this world where a lot of the best investors have been kind of the grandmasters. You know, they've been the sort of peer play. They haven't been using computers. I mean, they've been using them a little bit, but much less so than what I think the future is going to be. And, and they've been doing that. And now we're, we're moving into, the, we're shifting into the world of the centaurs, I would argue. And I think the, the best investors aren't necessarily going to be the grandmasters anymore. I think they might be the people who really know how to leverage the best of the computers and adapt it. So I think it's, it's about understanding where your strengths and weaknesses are and leveraging the computers in the areas where they thrive and, and sort of being agnostic about whether it's a pure human or a pure computer process, allowing whatever's the most fit to, to apply. So what I'm hearing there, Justin, is there's plenty of room for active investors. It's just maybe with our use of the lab at more, it's going to be human plus machine. The machine is going to automate things, but maybe dig in more efficiently to what fits with our, our view of the world. So there's still that judgment. You're saying, you know, the next 10 to 20 years, computers will not be able to assess that judgment. There's still going to be management teams to talk to. That's right. That's and a good, there's still going to be answers. And management, management is a good example of an area where computers are way behind people. So if, if, if I have a very good investor and I have a computer listening to a management interview with that investor and, and a manager, I would much more trust Paul Moraz's view on how if this person is a is a value creator of this manager versus the computer that did a machine learning process on it and i think that trust would be much higher for quite a some period of time now because there's so much complexity in that there's so much nuance in that whereas something like tell me which businesses have had the best return on capital you know which industries are the most attractive I'd, I'd prefer the computers. Uh, and it's got to be done right, but I would far prefer the computer who's going to be able to sort through all the noise and, and manage all the biases. It's not going to get attracted. Oh, my favorite, like I, I happen to love tech companies. So I might, you know, as, a, as an individual investor, I might kind of gravitate towards that and miss these opportunities over here. The computer's going to say, no, no, wait a minute. That's where you should be looking. Within that, is there an example you can give us of where we're, we're actually trying to take words, but pile them into a computer and say, well, what words are associated with investing characteristics that we really are attracted to? I think management quality is sort of the last thing that goes to the computers. As, as we were discussing, I think that's much more of a human judgment call. I mean, there are things you can, you can tinker with. An example of some of the things that were very early days on tinkering with high probability of failure, let's call it <laughs> as per the previous discussion, is doing things like teaching the machine 
hey, here are some president's letters, let's call it, from the early Amazon days or the early Buffett days of here's how he talked about to investors. So we're going to feed that into the machine and and the machine's going to read it all for us and it's going to figure out all the patterns and all the information that's in that Buffett letter, let's say. And we might give it 20 such letters or 30, the more the better because it'll be, it'll be trained better the more we give it. And then after we feed that in, then what we'll do is when new reports come out and there's thousands a day that are coming out from new companies that a tiny little company, so the next Jeff Bezos kind of writing his, you know, his commentary. Yeah, maybe we'll detect that. Maybe we'll, we'll the, the computer is able to go through all of that information and it'll find the one that kind of rhymes closest with the, with the Bezos early letter or, or that trained letter. So that's an example. I, I think for listeners to understand a very practical case of that is Rotten Tomatoes example, which maybe is worth talking about. I don't know if you yeah. want to talk about that. So, about so that. the Rotten Tomatoes example is most people are familiar with this. It's a, it's a website that judges or, or puts recommendations together on movies that people watch. And how do they do that? Well, it turns out the Rotten Tomatoes team is minuscule. They got like two or three people working at Rotten Tomatoes and they're putting out rec- you know, thousands of recommendations you know, all the time. Like it's just constantly um, being updated. How do these people do that? It's like these guys are ridiculously productive. Well, it's because they're not. It's the computers that are doing it. And how are they doing it? So the, the way it works is over time, they have trained it. So when a movie review comes out, they'll say, hey, computer, this is a positive movie review. And then a bad one will come out and they'll say, hey, Mr. Computer, this is a negative review. And so it'll feed 500 reviews into it and, and tell it whether it was a right. positive or a negative. So it's completely binary. It's good or bad. In this case, it's totally binary. And okay. and then the computer kind of learns that from the what, whatever you feed it. And then all the new movies that, are, that come out, the new reviews come out, the computer just takes all those new reviews and it just says, oh, well, based on all the stuff you've trained me with over here, I'm pretty sure that's a bad review or that's a good review. No human made that decision on whether it's got the fresh or the rotten tomato associated with it. And then it gets all amalgamated up into a total review. So nobody's actually deciding that. It's sort of the machines that have been taught by the people is making the ultimate decision. And, and it's a similar concept with, 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 that we're tinkering with on these kind of management discussions of, of, of applying that same methodology. Great. This is all fascinating stuff. So maybe want to round out the whole discussion in the lab with is maybe you give us a, a fast forward look and say in, in the next five years, what do you envision the lab to be um, doing? I think the way to think about it is take our process, more investment process, break it down as granular as you can get. So from, from how we screen to how we model companies to how we talk to management teams, Everything is fair game. And we're going to each of those processes with the lab and we're going to ask ourselves, can this be done better or can we at least supplement it with the computers? And and can we apply automation? So we've seen that. We've seen that with the DCF models. We've seen that with a lot of the screening is where the early wins have been. But we're going to continue that systematically until we get to a point where we're comfortable enough that we've got almost the whole process sort of covered and almost doing it in tandem with the analysts and then able to give them. So if an, if an analyst is, is researching a new company, I want to be able to give them a report that is the automated version. So before they even write their own due diligence report, they get a report that doesn't just give them the DCF model valuation, but it gives them the, the computer's view on the return on capital historically, filters out all the noise on where this company is versus the peers, you know, in terms of their ratios. It tells you, you know, as much as we can about management quality, kind of goes through the same process that the analyst is going to do manually and gives them sort of point form. Okay, here's the stuff I found as the computer. So as you're going through your manual process, yeah, you may, you, you want to look over and kind of compare notes to, to what the computer's telling you about the company. Okay. Does, does that de-emotionalize the process a bit and, de- and de-bias it? I think it de-biases. And I think the thing that the computer really excels at is it doesn't forget anything. It'll look systematically at all the information. It's so easy for a human you know, to focus on one area or one story or something that matters to them. This one is always going to apply the same systematic process to everything. So there's a lot of advantages, but I think that ultimately the investment decision and that analyst sitting in the driver's seat is vital because they get, there's a lot of times there's edge cases where the computer is a little off or it's missing some important factor that's shifting in the economy. You know, a good example is some of the stuff that screens really high today and and some of our our automated return on capital stuff is a lot of these retail businesses. So like companies that, you know, are are selling stuff in brick and mortar type shops. And it's like, well, the computers haven't, because the return on capital is great. 
And the valuations are like in the toilet. They're like $9 <laughs> PE ratio. And the computer's saying, this looks amazing. It's cheap and it's got a great return on capital. What are you doing? Buy right, this thing. Right. And it's like, well, there's this thing called Amazon coming along, you know? And it's like, well, we might want to think about what the impl- implication of that is. And the computer may not be able to see that yet because it's not quite in the data. So there, it's very important to still have that oversight from the human. Good way to round it out. So how I like to end podcasts is with a, a rapid fire list of questions that are a little more personal. But we'll, uh, you started, well, we, we use the poker analogy um, quite a bit. So let's start there. Hardest thing about poker? Patience. Favorite job interview question? Oh, I like p- how Peter Thiel does it. His question is something like, what is something that most people believe, including me, that is probably wrong? Hmm. So you, you try to get the person to be thinking in a controversial way, let's say. And the other thing I like about that question is there's something humble about it. It's sort of like, I want to learn something from you. Like, teach me something that I probably am wrong about. Very good. I do know you went to MIT, but I'll tell the listeners you went to MIT. So what's your best memory? Don't hold memory? that against me. <laughs> <laughs> we won't hold it against you. Um, best memory from your time at MIT? Uh, from MIT. So there are so many good memories. That was like the best school to go to. And the Boston area is just amazing for, for being a student because there's Harvard nearby and there's just a great student town. But actually my, my best memory would probably be on the Charles River. So they had these there's a river that goes splits between Cambridge and Boston. It's called the Charles. And they had these little sailing boats there and little dinghies, like two person dinghy sailing boat. And I, I would go there like twice a week and just sail on the Charles. And it was just so relaxing. I just loved it. So that, that's my favorite memory there. Switch gears again. I know you played linebacker. You shared that with me. So I'm going to say, or ask you, what's the favorite aspect of playing linebacker? Well, I, I appreciate that question because one of the things I like to tell people is Defense in football is way funner than offense because I actually played, I played running back as well, fullback. And what I found playing that was when, when you're playing fullback r- offense, there's a play and you got to execute the play. That's what you're supposed to do. When you're playing defense, it's all in the head. Like it's a game where you're trying to deduce the play. You're trying to figure out what the other team is doing and you got like half a second to figure it out. And so it's, it's actually, it's very cerebral versus offense. And I, and I really enjoyed that. I, I found it really fun to kind of figure out what's going on and then make that decision quickly. We've been uh, speaking with Justin Anderson and thank you for your time today. We'll have you on again soon. Okay, sounds good. Thanks for having me. Hey everyone, Cam here again. To subscribe to the Art of Boring podcast, go to more, that's M-A-W-E-R dot com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, leave a review on iTunes, which will help more people discover the Be Boring, Make Money philosophy. Again, thanks for listening.